Hello everyone. Thank you so much for the opportunity to tell you about one of my favorite vegetables, broccoli. Um, I'm a recent graduate from Cornell where I studied horticulture. I went pretty far down the broccoli research rabbit hole. Um, and I have to say, uh, for as much as I may have learned, I'm still absolutely amazed and fascinated by this vegetable. I feel like for everything I learned, I found myself asking even more questions about this really cool crop. I'm going to be presenting the results of a large study I ran where our team grew, evaluated, and sequenced the DNA of nearly every variety of broccoli we could get our hands on. So despite uh, whatever you've heard former presidents say or tropes on Saturday morning TV cartoons, Americans actually love broccoli. A poll of 4,000 Americans by uh, Green Giant uh, indicated that it's actually our favorite vegetable. Um, by 2015, the average American ate about 10 pounds of broccoli per year. And broccoli is approximately a $1 billion per year crop in the United States. So historically, nearly all of it has been produced in the West, where it's grown from northern Mexico, Arizona, California, and Oregon. And production will typically kind of follow uh, northwards during the summer, and then the pr broccoli production moves back down south as the seasons cool. So it's great that we can produce a year-round supply of broccoli, but there's been a long-standing goal of producing it more locally. A big part of this problem was that broccoli had to be shipped from the west coast to the east coast. Uh, this could take a week or two, um, and during that time the nutritional value and flavor could be reduced, as well as there being a, a pretty large carbon footprint associated with that transport. I was very lucky to be part of a specialty crop research initiative project called the Eastern Broccoli Project, where we studied the ways to more sustainably produce broccoli, uh, specifically doing so on the East Coast. Um, in my opinion, the Eastern Broccoli Project has been a real success story in plant science. It was a collaboration between the USDA, um, many universities, and private industry. Uh, it took a very interdisciplinary approach and really has catalyzed broccoli production on the East Coast. In fact, it's on track to meet a $100 million per year pr uh, production goal. So a really good investment, in my opinion. Much of the work I'll be discussing today was uh, research funded by and in support of the Eastern Broccoli Project. First, I want to show you a picture of two broccoli heads that I grew in the same field last summer. What do you notice immediately? So on the left is a early broccoli landrace selected from um, a population originating in southern Italy. Note that I'll be using the word landrace a lot, and by that I mean a local variety that has been under a varying degree of human selection over time. Um, a lot of people might use the word heirloom, although I tend to avoid that term as it's fairly poorly defined um, and less useful from a crop conservation perspective. So um, these open pollinated varieties, the farmer doesn't usually try to control which plant pollinates which plant, um, although she may make selections for plants that she likes or are disease resistant, for example. 
and on the right is a modern broccoli hybrid. Um, so this hybrid was made by carefully selecting two inbred parental lines. And if you do it carefully, nearly ha every head will look similar and mature at, the, at, at, a, at, at a similar time. Um, producing these hybrid varieties takes advantage of hybrid vigor, which is also called heterosis. Um, and you really see that effect in these modern high yielding broccoli hybrids. Um, so broccoli has changed a lot over time, but how and why? I had so many questions uh, during this research. How much diversity exists within a larger pool of uh, broccoli? Are these broccoli landraces a valuable resource? And if so, in what way? How much has broccoli changed over time uh, and during human selection? What can we learn about this improvement process? And maybe more importantly, what do we not know about this process? Uh, let's try to zoom out a bit and place ourselves kind of within the larger context of biology. So broccoli is a plant. And that's uh, stuff like that is why they pay me to be a scientist. Um, it's within the Brassicacea family where there are 4,060 accepted species. Um, also within Brassicacea are, is the model organism Arabidopsis, which is sort of thought of as the lab rat of the plant world, um, which is nice because it gives us a really powerful comparison um, when we do genetic studies of broccoli. Um, there's also a lot of important species within the genus Brassica. Three of them, uh, Brassica rapa, nigra, and oleracea, have two copies of their genome. Um, however, each of those species can come together and create new species of tetraploid. Um, today I'm going to be talking about just one of those, Brassica oleracea. Um, to push the metaphor even farther, Brassica oleracea has been called the dog of the plant world because it has so many different forms or phenotypes. Uh, Brassica oleracea includes broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, kale, Brussels sprouts, collard, Chinese kale and kohlrabi. Um, broccoli or italica <clears throat> has been selected for a large heading structure that experiences a particular and distinctive developmental arrest during the transition to flowering. This is a, a, a pretty good meme I saw on Twitter recently that illustrates the plasticity of this crop under human or art artificial selection. So we know that humans have been practicing selection on broccoli for probably about 4,000 years. We believe the center of diversity for Brassica oleracea is the Mediterranean basin, um, where you can still find numerous different crop wild relatives. Uh, for broccoli, uh, or Brassica oleracea italica, the local center diversity appears to be the southern Italian peninsula in Sicily. Um, we know that f small farmers and gardeners have been growing, selecting, and preserving these broccoli land races there for a long time. This represents a highly diverse and mixed gene pool um, that both what we would think of as broccoli and cauliflower were most likely selected out of. Um, we, we start seeing the word broccolo in the 17th century, which you could translate as sprout or nail. 
Um, so th just going back here quickly, this cartoon is absolutely an oversimplification of Brassica ulracea vegetables. And th there's really even more botanical classes just within broccoli. So my advisor, Thomas Bjorkman, and I were able to acquire a lot of different broccoli germplasm from that center of origin, southern Italy and Sicily. Um, we also were able to um, include all these modern broccoli hybrids that I mentioned before from nearly every major breeding program in the world. Um, and we grew those plants out in 2019 and 2020 and evaluated each um, cultivar for about 25 different horticultural quality traits. Um, on the right is an image of some representative heads that we grew in our field. Um, in addition, we generated about 30,000 DNA markers that covered the entire broccoli genome. And we found that there was a lot of genetic diversity contained within these Italian land races. Um, modern F1 hybrid Calabrese broccoli has undergone some very strong selective pressures and reduction in its diversity compared to those open pollinated land races that it was uh, bred from. And we identified four broad categories within this pool of broccoli diversity. So violet cauliflower, sprouting broccoli, calabrese broccoli, and modern hybrid calabrese broccoli. So morphologically, modern F1 hybrid calabrese broccoli <clears throat> is distinct from its land race predecessors. Um, it matures more rapidly. It has uh, more complete apical meristem dominance. It makes a big head. Um, it has a higher harvest index. The part of the plant that you eat is a greater percentage of the total plant weight. And it has just a lot of um, kind of improved head quality characteristics. We identified a number of different genomic selection signals um, near important genes that we believe uh, are important in uh, controlling these horticultural quality traits. Um, and this, the, the, this helps us to identify genes that humans have selected for during uh, domestication and subsequent crop improvement efforts. This is um, some of the collection locations for the broccoli land races that we included in our study. Um, so this is one, one kind of subpopulation, the Calabrese broccoli. So when most people think of broccoli, they think of Calabrese, the quintessential broccoli morphotype that you can find all around the world. Um, so we, those were typically collected from the southern Italian peninsula, the boot, um, and they're characterized by an arrest in development at the flower bud stage. Unlike cauliflower, where the arrest happens at the floral primordia stage. Um, over time, Calabrese production began to spread westward. Um, it brought, these types were introduced from Italy into the U UK in the 18th century and later into the United States by immigrants from southern Italy. Um, Brought this Calabrese type only truly became popular in the United States post-World War II um, following the development of some kind of improved open, open po pollinated cultivars like Waltham 29. You can still buy that um, cultivar today. Uh, this was followed by some very successful commercial breeding efforts where they produced hybrids such as Premium Crop, Pac-Man, and Marathon. Um, 
and a lot of those types were specifically bred for kind of the cooler valleys in the western U.S. Um, and that began to enable year-round production of broccoli. These purple cauliflower types are the, the most common in Sicily and have a what you'd think of as kind of an intermediate broccoli cauliflower phenotype. The leaf structure tends to be more cauliflower-like. Um, they have a intermediate developmental arrest. Their glucosinolate profiles tend to be between broccoli and cauliflower. Um, and they have variable curd coloring. So you can find purple, green, red, or white types. Although people typically refer to them as purple cauliflower. Here's a non-purple purple cauliflower um, that isn't accumulating anthocyanins like other purple cauliflower types do. Um, there's another subpopulation um, that's found both in Sicily and the southern Italian peninsula and is very diverse genetically and morphologically. They're, they're really so diverse they probably could be broken into subgroups. Um, I, how I would describe the sprouting broccoli type is a distinct vegetable class characterized by many lateral inflorescences, side shoots, kind of a small apical crown or head bisected by many, many leaves. Um, it tends to be very late to head and flower. And it has, uh, they typically have prized culinary properties. They are good. Some of those sprouting types look very distinct. Um, this is one of my favorites, both in terms of the aesthetics and its flavor. So this is a two-dimensional space that tries to represent the genetic diversity between these groups. So the closer two dots are together, the more similarity they share in their DNA. Um, we can see that they form pretty distinct groups, although um, the Calabrese land races, the orange triangles, and the Calabrese hybrids, the green circles, are pretty closely related. Uh, that makes sense because modern types were selected from those Calabrese land races. Uh, so I mentioned that broccoli was brought to the U.S. by Italian immigrants, um, and those the, the Calabrese type became uh, really the dominant form of broccoli, uh, especially in domestic agricultural production systems, and especially the target for these modern plant breeding techniques that we use. Um, so it's great that this really allowed us to produce a lot of high quality broccoli. Um, but this also kind of corresponds with what appears to be a very strong genetic bottleneck event. We found that um, modern broccoli cultivars are highly interrelated um, with less genetic diversity compared to their land race counterparts. Um, when comparing the landrace broccoli with modern broccoli hybrids, we found several genomic regions that were highly reduced in genetic diversity and exhibited evidence of selective sweeps. Um, so, so this work really provides a foundation for incorporating diverse genetic materials into broccoli breeding programs as well as underscores the critical importance of conserving these incredibly valuable brassica germplasm resources. So what's the point? I believe that um, this diversity is objectively valuable 
and worth conserving for its own sake. Not to mention the story of our crops is our story as well. Um, it, it's sort of on a more specific level, this diversity can be used to breed cultivars with local adaptation or resilience to pathogen pressures or climate change. I think that Griff, Hannah, and Jim will be telling you about some of their adventures in breeding this incredibly flexible and fascinating vegetable. So I, I want to th th thank you again for your time and please feel free to contact me if, if you have any questions. I love talking about this stuff.